time to study your word. We ask that once again to be with us through your spirit. You know the truths you want us to understand today. And we pray that you guide us into those truths. We know that you told us your truth is our shield against Satan's deceptions. And your truth is to lead us into paths of righteousness, as you say, into the right way that we might achieve the abundant life that Jesus promised to have. So may each of us be open to receive the truths you have for us. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, let's uh, take out your little card and put your name on it. We'll give you a quiz on the last lesson. See what you remember. This would be one through five, true and false. When a wicked person dies, he goes straight to hell. True or false? True or false? Number two, since God does not enjoy hell, he has put Satan in charge of poking people into the fire. True or false? I'm sure you like that. Number three, how far totally consumes and destroys the wicked as they attempt to attack the holy city at the end of the thousand years. So how far totally consumes and destroys the wicked at the end of the thousand years. Number four, the wicked are destroyed in the fires of hell. However, Satan cannot be destroyed because he is a spirit creature. We can destroy it. Satan cannot be destroyed. It's a spirit. Or false. And number five, the doctrine of an eternally burning hell comes straight from ancient paganism and not from the Bible. True or false? The doctrine of an eternally burning hell comes straight from ancient paganism, not the Bible. Okay, number one, when the wicked person dies, he goes straight to hell. False. They go to the grave. Number two, God does not enjoy hell, so he puts him in charge of holding people in the fire. False. Yes. Number three, hell fire totally consumes and destroys the wicked as they attempt to attack the holy city and the sinners. True. And number four, the wicked are destroyed in the fires of hell. However, Satan cannot be destroyed because he's a spirit creature. False. But I'm very clear, he too will be destroyed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. The doctrine of an eternally burning hell comes straight from ancient paganism and not from the Bible. That's true. As we looked at before, it's amazing how many false teachings are remain in Christianity back during those first few centuries. Well, let's get into today's lesson. And um, there's one scripture we'll start off by looking at. It's not even a lesson. But it's Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans 12, 1. Kind of sets the stage. Romans 12.1 He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So, we find that God wants us to present our bodies as helpful as possible. Now, we live in a world of sin, our bodies get old and tired and worn out. But he wants us to do our best, that our bodies, like it says, would be a living sacrifice. Now, there's a sequence here. Sacrifice, priest, king. And that's the sequence that has to be in. Think of Christ. He came to this world, and he became, became our perfect sacrifice. Right? Then he went to heaven, as we studied in our lessons, to the heavenly sanctuary, and now he functions as our priest. But he had to have the sacrifice first before he could be our priest. And the day is coming, as this lesson points out, 
it will be king. So he had to first be the sacrifice, then he had to be the priest, and then after that function, the king. Now we're going to see a similar scenario with us. Christ is a type of experience we're to have. When we begin our Christian life, we're born again, and we give ourselves to Christ 100% as a sacrifice and to serve Him the best we can. Sacrifice, once we've given ourselves to the Lord, then we're priests. This Bible talks about the priesthood of all believers. We're priests. We, we of course, can come directly to the Father, and priests, they intercede for others. We can pray for others and seek to bring them to God too. And then ultimately, as the lesson points out, we shall bring to Christ as kings. But it starts out being sacrificed, giving ourselves our mission to God. Now, what did the king allow Daniel and his friends to eat? Now, this is a little review. We're going to do a couple of things uh, that we've seen. We're going to do a little bit different angle. Uh, Daniel 1, verse 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now remember they were prisoners of war. However, Nebuchadnezzar was a wise king. And he knew all of the smart people weren't in his kingdom. So when he would conquer a kingdom, like he did the Jews, he realized there were some smart people among this conquered people. And so he would choose what he thought would be the best to groom them to become a part of his government. Which is pretty smart. Now, in order for them to be the best they could be, the king says, I want them to be fed off of my table. I eat the best food in Babylon. I want them to have the best food. And so the goal of the king was, was good. He wanted them to have the daily portion of the king's meat and of the wine that he drank. That was the king's desire. So they'd be healthy, smart. What decision did Daniel make regarding the king's wine and food? Notice verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel made up his mind that he would not disregard God's counsel. So he purposed, he was determined in his heart his decision was made that he would not defile himself. He knew eating the wrong kind of food would defile God. With the king's uh, meat, meat, or with the wine in the Now that was taking a chance. There's a feast that got angry at him and had uh, him killed. But at this point, the prince of the eunuchs, he was actually uh, over them. And it was his responsibility to take care of them as the king gave orders. So this sort of put the prince of the eunuchs in a difficult situation. And we find here what was the result of Daniel and his friends making this decision. Notice here in verse 20. In all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all this realm. So they were 10 times better, smarter, physically better. Now there's an interesting lesson here too, by the way. How to approach those in authority over you when you're asked to do something you feel is out of harmony with God's will. When you notice here in, in Daniel 1, notice um, 
verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the Indians. Now God was working here. So God worked on the part of their supervisor to look favorably on Daniel and his friends. So God was working to bring that about. Now, notice something else. Um, verse 10, And the prince of the eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your meat and drink. For why should he see your faces worse, lacking, than the children which are of your son, sword? Then shall the king then shall you make me in danger from my head to the king. So the unit wanted to do something, but he knew that if it didn't work, he'd lose his life. Now, one thing that's nice to notice here, Daniel didn't demand it. He didn't say, I'm a Jew, and I believe in the true God, and you don't, and I'm going to obey God, no matter what you tell me. That's kind of an arrogant, disrespectful approach to authority, and that's not God's way. No, you notice here in our first verse, look, it says Daniel requested. He first, in verse 8, he purposed in his heart to do the right thing, and then he requested of the prince. He didn't demand it. He requested. Can we do this? Showing respect. Now, notice here in verse 12. Prove your servants, I beseech you, ten days. Let them give us all to eat and water to drink. And let our countenances be looked upon for you. And the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as you see, deal with your servants. So he approached them, and here's another principle. He approached them respectfully. He requested that this be done. And part of the request, it had the same goal the Prince of the Unix had. That they'd be healthier, smarter. So their request was connected with, the, with what the goal was. So they wanted to meet the goal that the king had and the prince of eunuchs had, but they wanted to do it the way they knew God wanted them to do it. So they respectfully approached the prince of eunuchs. God was working on this prince of the eunuchs' heart to be in favor of Daniel and them. And they said, give us this 10-day test. And then see. Now that's fair. If what we're doing and following God's way, we look healthier and are better, okay, that's the proof of the pudding. <laughs> If not, so be it. So that, that was the test. Since Daniel and his friends had passed the diet test, what other tests were they now able to pass? Well, this is how God works in our life. The first test they faced was on following God on, on God. If they had proven unfaithful there, then I don't think we'd have the rest of the book of Daniel as we have. But proving God faithful in the beginning, now that we're ready for the next test and the next test. And we know the next test that came. There's the one about the golden image, the three Hebrews refused to worship the golden image. Now, you remember the story. There was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of a statue of a man, and that represented human history. The head was gold, chest and arms silver, stomach and thighs brass, legs iron, feet iron and clay. And then the rock came and destroyed it. And Daniel said, King Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold represents you. But there's another kingdom after you that's going to come up and overthrow you. Well, the king didn't like that. He said, no, no, no. There's not going to be no kingdom to overthrow me. 
So, in defiance of God, I'm going to make a statue that's all gold. You see, it's actually an affront to God. And so, there were several issues here. Everyone that would would go along with the king's command that when the music was sound, they had to bow down to the image. They were doing a couple things. They, they were, of course, going against the command of God not to bow down to the images. And secondly, they were giving acknowledge to the king and his view of what's going to happen in opposition to God's view. So who are you going to believe? Who are you going to worship? King or God? Well, we know the story. The three Hebrews decided not to do that. They were thrown in the furnace, very hot, but God protected them. And they came out, no smell of smoke, and even the bonds burned off. But not, nothing harmed them. And that's a good illustration for the end time. Remember, some of wondered when we talked about the New Jerusalem coming down and God's people are in the new Jerusalem with Christ. But everything outside is being devoured by an intense fire. But God's people are safe in there. Yeah. Just like here. So that was an important test to put God first. And don't go against his word. Then there was another test. This time, this came along at the time of the Medes and Persians. And many were jealous of them the other rulers in the area. And they, as happens in politics today, they were trying to find things to criticize. I don't care what party you're in, the other party trying to find things to criticize, right? So that was going on back then. But it was amazing they could find nothing in Daniel to criticize. That is amazing. <laughs> and, and I guarantee you they looked very closely. Is there anything in Daniel's life, anything in his dealings with others, anything that we can take to the king and say, look at Daniel, you shouldn't be here. Couldn't find a thing. What a testimony of the kind of moral, ethical man Daniel was. But they did find one area. His religion. I guess if there's... If, God willing, if that were the case for us, hopefully if they found error be in our religion, that we're doing something in life, but we're doing it in the the word. Okay. And so they knew Daniel prayed every day, and they knew he'd open his windows and pray for Jerusalem. Everybody saw this. And he'd pray a lot. That, you know, that's how they prayed in the Old Testament. Pray a lot. So they said, okay, king, we want you to make a decree that nobody can pray to anyone but you. Okay. Appeal to the king's evil. And if they don't go by this, they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. <coughs> you know the story they taught Daniel. And here's another example, too. Daniel did not hide his religion. He could have went off into a closet, some, some corner, and prayed. But if he did that, remember there's a text that says, abstain from all appearance of evil. If he would have done that, he would be given the appearance that is going along with the king's decree, which would have been evil as far as the relationship with God. So our example is important too, to others. And so now he did what he usually does. Open his windows, pray the love toward Jerusalem. And they broke the king, and he was thrown into the lion's den. And God shut the mouth of the lions, and then he survived that. But again, if the first test had not been victorious, with the king's meat now, the other two tests would not have been victorious. That's how it is in the Christian life. The more we obey God and follow His will, the stronger we get in the Lord. When we start putting aside some things that God wants us to do and, and choose to neglect them and not do them, it weakens us. And we're not as strong to meet the next challenge. 
So that's a very important principle in, um, in Christianity, like in the Old Testament, too. Now, notice the test of what two things did Daniel refuse to partake of here. We've seen that on the king's table, the king's meat, and the king's wine. Why did Daniel not partake of the king's wine? In Proverbs 20, verse 1, actually gives us, I think, the whole verse there. Wine is a mocker. By the way, in the Bible, wine can refer to either grape juice or fermented grape juice. So you've got to look at the context to know what they're talking about. Now, it says wine is a mocker, then what's the next word? Strong drink. What do you think? Do you think it's fermented or unfermented? Fermented. So the context tells you. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So wine. Now be careful. And then this is the next thing. One, we can read this. What are the kings and princes not to drink? Proverbs 31, 4.
So who are the kings in the New Testament? We are. So there's that sequence. Sacrifice, priest, as this text even says, it's made of priest, and king. And so we want, when you say sacrifice, sometimes there's things you may quote, sacrifice or give up that God asks you to for the sake of being the best possible Christian you can. I had a book some years ago that says, others can, but you can't. Others can, but you can't. And that, that's kind of a phrase that applies to Christians. Because there's others that may go get involved with stuff, but when we know God's word, no. We don't want to do that. And here's a little bit about alcohol, what does alcohol do to the brain? And I won't go through the exhibit with you, but uh, there's a lot of medical information out that shows what alcohol will do. It does destroy brain cells. I need as many of those as I have to get. And brain cells don't reproduce. I remember seeing um, a film, a health film, where they had a brain of an alcoholic, they dissected it, and they had a brain of someone who had been, at least not in alcohol. And you can see the very difference between the two. The, the brain of the alcoholic, you can see the deterioration and the destruction that was taking place in the brain, where the non-alcoholic, that wasn't there. So, why is to keep away from it? What foods did God forbid his ancient people Israel to eat? Leviticus 11 to 8. Just skimming them right off the surface, all the crud. 
So they have a purpose, but we don't need them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if it has sense and scales, it's fine. If not, it's not. So that does away with, you know, prawns and clams and shellfish, things like that. Now, they'll clean up the bottoms of the ocean and stuff, but not, again, not designed to eat. Uh, and it's nice. God's made it easy for us to tell. I notice in Leviticus here it never mentions about the blood, but other other places it mentions don't eat the blood because that's the life. Yes, if the Jewish folks they have kosher, right? They hang meat, it upside down and they drain the blood. Up. Yeah, it's a hard that's right. Because there's a lot of stuff in the blood that's not so good. Um, and if you don't, because when the animal gets killed, there's a lot of hormones, there's uric acid, a lot of different things that's still in the blood. And, but if you drain out the blood, then that stuff won't be there. Now, I've never eaten kosher meat, but I hear it doesn't quite have the flavor of the other meat. So I guess the, the blood's giving you the flavor. So there, there's those counsels as well. I happen to be vegetarian. I became a vegetarian in my 30s. Um, I'm not saying you've got to become vegetarian. That's your, your choice. But I will say, for me, um, in my family, there's uh, heart disease and there's diabetes. My brother, who's just a little older than me, he's had uh, an heart surgery. My birth father, who I met once, he, um, I, I understood he had open heart surgery in the 40s, several times. Um, and my brother has diabetes. So uh, I don't have any of that. And I attribute it that the Lord convicted me become vegetarian in my 30s, and um, it's, it's proved to be a blessing. Amen. Uh, I, I've enjoyed watching some health programs at times, and I remember sometimes <coughs> I was watching one, and they tried to induce diabetes. You know, they do these test groups. They could not induce it with sugar. <coughs> they could induce it with animal fat. Which I thought was interesting. Animal fat. So, keeping away from the animal fats, that, at least for me, that's proven to be a blessing. And I know there's certain people that have more predisposition to some things than others. So, uh, but it, it's good. But follow the thing on the food. Uh, the, I believe the uric acid is in the meat, and so when an animal knows it's going to be killed, yes. like when they go through the slaughter, they excrete that <coughs> uric acid, and it's actually in the um, in the meat. I don't know if it's in the marble or what, but it's in the meat. And so that's why you're saying years ago, if you just went out and shot an animal, he didn't know he, he or she didn't know she was going to die, that you've eliminated that if you're going to eat meat. And then the other thing is when I've talked to an Orthodox Jew, they're butchered. I don't know if they still do it the same way, but the way, it's so inhumane the way they kill this animal. He's not totally dead. They cut his neck and hang him upside down yeah. to drain the blood out. I mean, that's how could you possibly eat that? Yes. Yeah. Well, God did give permission. <laughs> uh, so I just say do your own research. Find out what you think is best for you. And I will say it's better to have a balanced meat diet than an imbalanced vegetarian diet. So, you know, approach these things with some logic and education and understanding. <coughs> Why did God prohibit eating of pork, shellfish, and other unclean foods? You, we won't read those. You've got them in your exhibit. Uh, a lot of medical information on those. Why not eat them? As I see it, it's kind of like when you, when you buy a new car, or any car, you want to put the right gas in it. And if you put the wrong gas in it, it's going to do damage to the engine. Well, same with us. If we put the wrong fuel in, we, we, may, we may not die the next day, but it's going to affect our, our body in, in due time. What kind of diet did Daniel ask to receive? Let's go back to Daniel 1. Verse 12. 
He said, Prove thy servants, I beseech you, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So pulse and water, pulse would have been vegetables and water. That's the diet they, they went on. And he asked for a ten day test. I, there seems to be something about ten days, a few weeks. I think I've shared with you before, but in this context, I'll share again. Back in the 70s, there's an individual called Nathan Pritikin. He had the Longevity Research Institute. Uh, he had a program full to health problems. It was a diet exercise program. The diet was 10% fat, 10% protein, 80% complex carbohydrate for cal as calories. You, you figure that based on the calories of what you're eating. And they have to do walking exercise. So a couple of doctors and I, I was in Yakima, Washington. We heard about that. We went down to, uh, I think it was in Santa Barbara. He had his long longevity research institute. We got there, I think he had maybe, it was near the end of one of his four week, four -week program. And uh, had a chance to visit with him and talk to a few of the patients that were going there. He was having, which was back in the 70s, a lot of this was unheard of, healing um, diabetes, uh, healing, he, healing heart disease, arteries were open. I, I remember right back then, they didn't think arteries would be open, but naturally started being opened up. Uh, and he made a statement that brought that into my mind when we were talking to him. He said, you know, the first at the beginning, those that go through this program complain a lot. They don't like the food, they don't like the exercise. But he said, after about two weeks, the complaining stops. And now they're getting used to the food, they like the food, they're feeling better, they're enjoying the exercise. And that reminded me again, this dad of the test was 10 days. So there seems to be something in our body let's say two weeks, if we got on a certain regimen for two weeks, our body is created that it'll tend to adapt to that and we'll get used to that and it can be a, a blessing for us. And the body, when, when we follow God's guidelines, the body has a way of healing itself if we're putting the right kind of stuff in, in the body. And I'll say this from an Adventist point of view, we've always had an emphasis on health since the 1800s. But it kind of slowed down there. And then, uh, because of what Nathan Pritikin did, it got our attention again. And that's when Waymar began. And we set up a Total Health Foundation Northwest in Yakima. Had a nice home and an orchard, and people would come and stay. And we're all getting the same results. And so God used, which he does sometimes, someone outside the nomination to draw our attention to what we already knew was the right thing to do. And then some of these institutions got established. So it's kind of interesting to see the history and how God, God works in those ways. At what event does God first mention clean or unclean animals? Genesis 7, 1 and 2. Before the flood. 
Why do you think he said, you know, the unclean bring, bring a pair to them? The clean bring seven. What do you think that was? You're going to eat <laughs> the clean. Everything else is gone. Vegetation was gone. Yeah, vegetation was gone. So you're going to you're eat uh, the clean meats, not the unclean. Also, the clean meats were used for sacrifice. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. We We do not want downloads. There it is. So, um, yeah, the clay meats were also used for sacrifice. When you think about it, Daniel comes out of that ark. Not Daniel, Noah. Comes out of that ark. <coughs> Noah comes out of that ark. And there's nothing, and he's got 14 clean animals. What about the Yeah, I don't know where they're right now. He's got 14 clean animals. And now he's going to sacrifice some of them. And that's the only stuff he's got to eat. That took some faith, right? Yeah. So, um, but he knew you put God first, God will take care of you. But yeah, the. The dove did find an olive branch, so I told him, okay, we can we can land now. So yeah, there was some stuff. Yeah. That was at the time of what? Uh-huh. How come you're talking about so much food that they should eat and not eat? This is not in the one of the Ten Commandments. Okay, good point. The question is, this is not in the Ten Commandments. Every sin is in the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments says, thou shalt not kill. Even applies to ourselves, right? So if I do something that's going to shorten my life, I'm actually going against that commandment. Also, there's a command that says, thou shalt not covet. Coveting is wanting something that's not yours. God says, okay, everything belongs to me. Here's the unclean, here's the clean. These I give you to eat, these I don't. We may covet though and say, no, I want some of these. So actually there could be a couple commandments involved there. The commandment not to kill and the commandment not to covet. So when you look deep into the Ten Commandments, whatever sin you come across will fit somewhere in the Ten Commandments. What was the purpose of the unclean animals? I mean, besides reproducing, what? He didn't want them to be destroyed. Okay. And they have, and they have a purpose on the earth. They'll keep. Oh yeah, right. Scavenger some stuff. And I think there's yeah. some beauty there. God wants us to enjoy the animals, not eat all of them, uh -huh. but enjoy them. Yeah, that might. So there's, there's that aspect to it. Then. Yeah. And then our life expectancy is short to death for that too. So eating meat. But even though it's clean, does that have something to do with our life expectancy? Yes. Right. The original diet before sin was fruits, grains, nuts. And the garden of After sin, fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables. Because before sin, they had the tree of life to eat from. But after sin, no more trade of life. So now they can eat the vegetables. Fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables. But there's no directive to eat the meat in the, in the before the flood. And they lived for hundreds of years. Yeah. Methuselah, 969 years. Then when the flood came, after the flood, then God gave them permission to eat the clean animals. And then, and then the life expanded, started going down again. And the Bible says, three score and ten, if by strength, four score. So 70 to 80 years in general, and sometimes beyond. But that, that's kind of where we're at. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. What, when did the vegetables come in? Pardon? The vegetables. After sin and then 
when the vegetables come in. Yeah. After the yeah. So you gotta destroy the plant to eat the vegetable. Uh-huh. After the flood. Yeah. And so when did the meat come in? After the flood. Oh, so vegetables and meat both came in after the flood? No, uh -huh. the vegetables after sin and man was driven out of the garden. Okay. We had the tree of life before sin. Yeah, that tree of life. That would keep sustain them. And by the way, that's part of the reason man closer to the tree of life in time lived longer. Because they still had some of that tree of life, and whatever it was, in them, and, uh, and they pass it on to their children, to their children, and so they can live longer. That's in part why they live longer. And then that kind of weakened, if you will. So is the tree of life a fruit? Yes. Yeah, the tree of life is fruit. And there, there was something in that that sustained eternal life. It says in Revelation that he leaves with the tree or for the human. Which doesn't mean you get sick, it's for the sustaining too. So but Genesis doesn't say they ate the leaves, maybe they did. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, those are good questions. Okay, what will happen to people using the unclean food sacred by Christ? In quote the text, they shall sanctify themselves, purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh. And the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. So as there's some cultures that eat mice. I guess they dip them in honey and then swallow them. Not me. You know, what's interesting, it is what you get used to. My dad, when I was a kid, he'd open up a can of sardines. And, you know, those who've seen sardines, they, they weren't cooked as far as I know. They were like in mustard or something. You'd pull them out and you'd eat them. Oh, my dad eat them, I'd eat them. And I didn't think anything about it. Well, now I think about eating a sardine, you know. But it's what you get used to. So, people that's used to eating mice, what's the deal? Why don't you like eating mice? You know? They do eat it. Uh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So, we can't go by what we think feels right to eat. See that? You gotta go by what the word of God says is okay to eat. Because we're all screwed up in the head. <laughs> we sin. So that's why we gotta stay by God's word. And uh, this one I'm gonna look at, Peter's vision. This is uh, an important one. You've got that in your exhibit. I've had every text given to me, I'm sure to try to contradict what the Bible teaches on diet. This is one text that many people use to say, oh, you can eat whatever you want. Well, let's go over here to Acts. And Acts 10 here. And we'll start off with verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on the journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon unto him, as it had been a, a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down the earth. Wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not thou come. This was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received again up to heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius and made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Peter was confused. 
this vision went against what he knew the Bible taught. So it wasn't making sense to him. Now, what was happening here, Cornelius, who was a Gentile, uh, God had, had told him he needed to go see Peter. And so he, he sent others to go get Peter. And, and Peter went with them to Cornelius' house. And then verse 28 and 29, Now, Cornelia, uh, Peter's at Cornelius' house now. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of the nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came in unto you without being saying, as soon as I was sent, sent for. I asked, therefore, what intent you have sent for me. Now, it's hard for us to put ourselves back there. But there was a very, very strong teaching, belief, in the Jewish faith of Christ's day, Peter's day, that the Jews were so exclusive, they're God's people, and don't allow yourself to get defiled by associating with non-Jews, the Gentiles. So they had laws, very strict. You talk about prejudice. Um, the strict Jews back in that day, there's still some of that today, not in general as people, but there's some of that prejudice attitude that uh, it was so bad that you might remember when Gentiles started being saved. They had to call a council in Jerusalem. You read that in Acts 15, 16 or so. A council in Jerusalem because they said, what are we going to do? The Gentiles are coming. And they said, well, we need to have them follow the law of Moses and this, that, and other thing. And, and they were even questioning, was God even calling them? And you remember the answer that was given. It said, look, God gave them the same Holy Spirit He gave us. Well, if he's given them the Holy Spirit light, he must be calling them. That was the evidence they used, which was correct. So there's a real controversy, turmoil. What are we going to do the Gentiles? Should we be let them in? And it was so strong in Peter that God knew if he didn't really shake Peter up a little, Peter could very well refuse to go to Cornelius' house because he's a Gentile. So God gives him this vision, which really gets his attention, and he's wondering what in the world is going on here. But on his way to Cornelius, he says, God showed me. And you notice here what he said, that I should not call any man on my own thing. So this scripture is applying to human beings, not to animals. Uh, if, if people look at the actual context of it. And that's why when Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, he's referring to all kinds of men. Jew, Gentile, men, women of all nations. So, and also, to me, this vision supports the King of Unclean teaching because Peter, this is after the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's still following the King of Unclean laws. So, as far as he was concerned, Jesus didn't change him. Okay. What was the first test given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Eat the fruit. She acknowledged good and evil. So, the first test was on appetite. She chose to distrust God and believe Satan. What was the first test that Christ faced in the wilderness? Turn stones to bread. Appetite. He'd been 40 days fasting. Satan said, if you're the Son of God, turn his back into bread. Jesus had to live like we live. He had to trust his Father to feed him. So, appetite again. How are Christians to glorify God? He says, whatever you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all the glory of God. We glorify God by our eating, our drinking, anything we do. Properly represent him.
What is the temple of the Holy Ghost for Christians? Our bodies. We look at where the Holy Spirit lives in us. We're the temple. What should the Christian do who have been what with Christ? Glorify God in your body. Properly represent God. Mm -hmm. What are some habits that born again Christians should leave alone? Uh, smoking, not a good idea to smoke. They give you a bunch of facts here. We'll get a little late. I think I'll, I'll go through these with you. Most of us, I think, know the danger of smoking. How about beverages? We talked about that. Eating unclean foods. Uh, be careful of ca caffeinated stuff. Caffeine, uh, morphine, codeine, caffeine. What do you hear that's common? Eem. They're the same family of drugs. Now, some are more powerful than others. For that family. Yes. Does that leave you okay with decaffeinated? <laughs> the decaf? I think there's folks that would wear decaf rather than the regular. It still has caffeine. Yeah, maybe not as much, but I'd say in these areas, pray to, pray to the Lord about it and let Him lead you as you grow in. Yeah, but be, be aware of it. It'd be a problem. Water's still the best. Water's the best. That's right. And green since it's pardon green tea. Yeah, there's a lot of teas that don't have caffeine. That's good. So, but they've actually done studies. And of everything you drink, your best effect on you is water. Really. What are some of the positive things Christians do to improve their body? Tempos. Well, here's kind of an interesting one. Let me get through this. To start, that each letter represents some nutrition. We've been talking about that. Exercise. I've heard reports, studies, exercise can even be more important than diet. Health. Some use water, sunshine, temperance, that means self control and all things, air, breathe good air, and rest. We should have, I just saw this on a soccer program the other day, we need to keep in the right. Regimen of rest. When you generally go to bed at night, when you generally wake up, try not to break that cycle. Because that's your body gets the best out of it. Remember that cycle is. And trust in God. That's the new start. Who came out better there in Daniel's day? Daniel's friends. And it's your desire to. Um, have a clear mind, passing the health test, so you're ready for the round of crises. And that's our, our desire. Okay, well, let's go ahead here. Let's have a prayer. We'll be sure you get the next lesson. And then uh, Ike is here today. Yeah, we'll put a hole in that for time. Uh, Ike is here today. Ike, we're going to have our garden prayer afterwards. Most definitely. Okay. So those that want to join Ike for a special prayer time in the sanctuary, uh, you can go up and say prayer. We do thank you, Father, that you are a loving Father. And as our Father, you're concerned about every aspect of our life. And we thank you that in your word you've given us instruction. How we can have the best possible life. Whether it's physical health, emotional health, spiritual health. We thank you for your truths. And I pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you will continue to guide us into the truths of your word. And if there's things that need to be changed in our life, I pray that by your Spirit, you will lead us into those. And we thank you and leave yourself in your care in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we give you